Good evening, everyone. Tonight, uh, we are going into the second section of the whole program that we had. Uh, Zoom on our Catholic beliefs, practices, and morals. We are on the second section, which we would be, which will be focused on our practices. This is part two of the series. After we have completed the foundational uh, tenets of our faith, which is very important for us to appreciate our practices as well as our rules of morals, we are now uh, going into this section. So our Catholic practices is a way by which we try to express our worship of God. It's important therefore that we look into the principle behind the uh, different practices that we have. For instance, the practice of using images and statues and our praying to the saints and the mass that we have, all of this will be taken up. And of course, all the sacraments, we will understand why we have these sacraments that we have in the church, right? So our subject for this evening actually will be the uh, sacramental encounter with God. Let's go to the next slide now. Sacramental encounter with God. Next slide, please. Everything is spiritual about us is expressed physically. God created us with our five senses. And naturally, we try to relate with God using our five senses. So we call that seeking God to our finite nature. If you look at that icon there, we are reaching out to God. And God is reaching out to us himself. He wants us to experience him in a personal way by bending to our level, reaching us to the finite. This is what we call our sacramental encounter with our creator. God is the uh, author of all our senses, our sense of sight, our sense of touch, our sense of smell. All of this will be put in use in us trying to relate with God. But uh, I know that our non-Catholic Christians uh, would always raise the question that are we, we are not supposed to be uh, using images or statues or any sacramentals because the scripture says that we should worship God in spirit and in truth. And they understand that scriptural passage to mean that we can only pray and worship God internally. Well, as you know, I have had my uh, uh, experience with the non-Catholic uh, Christian denominational groups. And, you know, when we, in all these uh, services that I attended, you wouldn't see any, any image at all. No picture of Jesus, no cross, except uh, the Lutheran, I think they still have the cross, but I, I was never a Lutheran. I was a Pentecostal uh, Protestant before, way, way back. What we used to do was raise our hands, jump with joy, clap our hands. So we sing and really express it with our gestures but we are not having any images at all. So as far as trying to sense God, we always, we would just close our eyes and sort of like fantasize God. And that is because of the scriptural passage that has always been emphasized in John chapter four, verse 23 to 24. Let's go to the next slide. Worship God in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4, 23 to 24. But an hour is coming, and it is now, 
when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father also seeks such to worship him. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Does that mean that we cannot really have this image of God before us? No, that is not what it means. Uh, as I said, it's important for us to understand script, uh, scriptural interpretation. It is very clear that, that in John chapter 4, verse 23 to 24, what is being emphasized is the fact that true worship of God must be in the spirit of God. We try to be united in the spirit of God because it is only the spirit of God that enables us to worship God himself. And we should unite we should pray in truth because you know if if we don't know the truth about god we can we can uh, our prayers can be very much out of out of this uh, real truth that god has given us for instance what if we start praying that uh, god destroy our enemy that would not be in accordance with god's revelation because god's revelation says that you must love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you. So this is what worshiping in the spirit and in truth is all about. We soak ourselves in the spirit of God. And uh, we are more uh, attuned to our spiritual needs than our temporal needs. All right, so that is what worshiping in spirit and in truth. But later on, we will explain why we use images and statues and many other sacramentals. But first, let's understand what we call the incarnational principle. Next slide, please. Incarnational principle, next slide, is the physical manifestation of God. God came down to us. His only be to his only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the summit point of our sacramental encounter with God, the humanity of Jesus Christ. So when he, he came down he, himself to be with us, so that we can hear him, we can see him, we can touch him, we can so all our, our senses are now made active in relating with our Lord Jesus Christ in person. And then as we all know, he ascended into heaven, but before he ascended into heaven, he founded his church so that he could perpetuate himself. So God would still be with us through the church, a visible church. So the church now is the sacrament of Jesus. This is the church, this is the channel of grace to which all the other sacraments are being dispensed to us. So Jesus continues to be with us in a visible manner by means of this church that he has founded. He continues to teach us. He continues to be with us even physically in the Eucharist. We will get to that. All right. So. Let's now go into understanding the use of sacramentals. Next slide, please. Sacramentals. What are these sacramentals? Oh, you see them in that picture over there. Images, statues, relics, holy water, scapula, incense, bells, beads, candles, blessed palms, ashes. So all of these are physical uh, items. These are the sacramentals. This is our way of sensing God. We are not worshiping any of this. Even if we kiss the sacramentals, it does not mean that we are worshiping it. Right? So they just uh, are they're there to remind or aid us in our devotion to God. Because as I have said, and as we know, we have, we are a creature of five senses, and we we uh, are relating with God through our senses. That's inevitable. 
But these sacramentals should not in any way be regarded as magic. What is magic? Next slide. Magic means uh, these sacramentals, next slide please, uh, as uh, something material is uh, regarded as the cause of something spiritual. That's magic. It's not to be regarded like that at all. They are there, simply there to awaken our senses. These sacramentals, let's understand this, because it could be superstitious if we think that the, the very object itself is the one uh, giving us the grace. That's not so. We must understand that as Catholics. And I believe most Catholics understand it that way. These are not medium even of grace. These are merely there to, so that we can help ourselves focus our attention in our worship. So as I said, they're there to simply awaken our senses towards God. They do not and cannot produce effects. They are not conveyors of grace like the sacraments. We'll take up the sacraments also later on. These are the actual conveyors of grace, right? But the sacramentals, in, not in any way, can be used like the way uh, superstitious practitioners do. It should never be the case. All right, so why do we use all the sacramentals? They're all exemplified in scriptures, especially relics, the relics of the saints, right? Okay, let's go to the next slide now. The relics and the use of matter exemplified in scripture, we will take up. 2 Kings chapter 13, 21, Matthew 14, 36, Mark 5, 30, Acts 5, 15, Acts 19, 11 to 12. Let's go to the next slide. We'll start with 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 21. This is exemplifying in the Old Testament the, uh, the uh, use of relics in a way. Here, let's read it together. Then Elisha died. And they buried him. Elisha, as you know, is one of the prophets, one of the greatest prophets. And the raiding bands from Moab invaded the land in the spring of the year. So it was as they were burying a man that suddenly they spied a band of raiders and they put the man in the tomb of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. So in the Old Testament, that exemplifies the use of relics, the bones of Elisha. Let's go to the next slide. In the New Testament now, we all are familiar with this. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 36, the people that were following him, they begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak. The edge of his cloak is a sacramentally. It's, a, it's, a, it's an object. And all who touch him were healed. And then in Mark chapter 5, verse 30, Jesus, aware at once that power had gone out from him, you know, when the woman touched the hem of his garment, he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who has touched my clothes? So this again exemplifies the use of sacramental. And then in the book of Acts, next slide now. Acts chapter 5, verse 15. They even carried the sick out into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets, so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any one of them. And as you know, in that account, the shadow, when the shadow of uh, Peter touched uh, the the sick, they got healed. And this is even more dramatic in Acts chapter 19, verses 11 to 12. Paul has been healing. Uh, he has that great gift of healing from God. So there were so many people that were rushing to him, but not everybody could get close to him. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. So that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sea and their illnesses were cured 
and the evil spirits left them. That's in Acts chapter 11, verse 12. They could not get close to uh, Paul, so what they did, his handkerchief and aprons were brought to the sick, and when they were touched by the sick, they got cured. So these are use of sacramentals exemplified in scripture, all right? But again, let's remind ourselves, it's not the object itself that caused the healing. It is God always who is the cause of any healing by any of his disciples, all right? And this is simply to, to awake their senses in the, in, the, in the healing power of God. Right, let's go to the uh, next slide now. Oh, by the way, Jesus himself was using clay in some instances when he healed uh, the blind, all right? And he would touch. Sometimes he had to touch. Or he could have just utter be healed and they would be healed. But sometimes he would use a clay, he would touch. So he used, he used uh, objects, all right? So this is this is a practice, uh, just even used by Jesus himself. Now, how about the use of images and statues? Is that idolatry? Well, that has always been the accusation against Catholics, because uh, they always refer to Exodus chapter twenty, verses four to five. Let me read that to you. You shall not carve idols for yourselves in the shape of anything in the sky, in the sky above, or on the earth below, or in the waters beneath the earth. You shall not bow down before them or worship them. Now they are taking this literally. But actually, if you really look into the context of uh, this passage, it does not in any way prohibit the use of images. Unless one worships the image itself, okay? What is prohibited is not the making and religious use of images, but the worship of them. In fact, there were instances where God himself ordered the making of images. So in and of itself, having an image or statues is not idolatry because they are, the use and the making of them is not the one being prohibited, okay? You should not carve idols for yourselves in the shape of anything that was meant at the end for worship. That is what it meant. No idols or images meant for worship. You are not supposed to, to worship those idols and images themselves. God even commanded the making of images. Let's go to the next slide. Images of things in heaven. Next slide. All right. Exodus chapter 25, verse 18. Thou shalt make two cherubim, cherubims of beaten gold on the two sides of the oracle. That was the instruction given by God. Make an image of cherubim, of so beaten gold. So that is making an image of things in heaven. So that explains that the making of images is not what is prohibited, but it's the worship of it. Next slide, another, another instance in the book of Exodus. This one is very interesting. Numbers chapter 21, verse five to nine. The people complained against God and Moses. Why have you brought us from Egypt to die in this desert? Where there is no food or water. We are disgusted with this wretched food. In punishment, the Lord sent among the people Sarah serpents, which bit the people so that many of them died. Then the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned in complaining against the Lord and you. Pray the Lord to take the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And God gave this instruction. The Lord said to Moses, make a sarap and mount it on a pole. And if anyone who has been beaten looks at it, 
he will recover. Accordingly, Moses made a bronze serpent. Now, he was instructed to make an image of things on earth beneath. Okay? And whenever he had been bitten by a serpent, look at the bronze serpent, he recovered. So everyone who just look up on that hanging bronze serpent, you see that on the picture there, they were here. So God instructed the use of an image, the bronze serpent. And this is very symbolic, really. And, and, and in fact, it, it prefigures the our, our Lord Jesus Christ dying on the cross. Can you see that? Yeah. It's like when you look up to Jesus Christ, then you will be healed. Meaning, if you submit yourself and worship Jesus and follow him and make him your Lord and Savior, look up to him, you will be saved. What a very uh, wonderful prefigurement of this account in the Old Testament in what Jesus did for us. And in fact, now, you know, the medicine emblem, it looks like that. It stands for healing. So it is very clear that God himself instructed his people to make an image. One, the cherubim, and this other one, a bronze serpent. All right. Now, another question that they, you know, Try to understand this. Even our non-Catholic Christians, sometimes they cannot avoid making images themselves. Even if you know they, they accuse us of idolatry, they themselves do have images of uh, the nativity where there is Jesus, the statue of Jesus, Mary, and the child Jesus. They do have that thing. So sometimes the, we, the, that should really make our, them rethink about their accusation against Catholics in the use of images. And then another one, there are non-Catholic Christians always say that why do we make an image of Jesus or make an image of, uh, of God, of the Holy Spirit, of, of God the Father? You know, the, because in the Old Testament, it is very clear that the, the Israelites did not at all see God in any form. But it, in fact, God uh, gave them a vision later on. In Daniel chapter seven, uh, next slide, let's go to that. The image of the, uh, the visible, God revealed himself, himself in visible form. Daniel chapter 7. Let's go to the next slide. Next slide, please. Daniel chapter 7. God the Father in visible form. Verse 9. I beheld. No, no. Next. Uh, let's get back to the previous slide. Okay. I beheld till the thrones were cast down. And the ancient of days did it. Ancient of days refers to God the Father today. Whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. They saw a vision of God the Father in that form. Next slide. What about the Holy Spirit? Let's go now to the next slide. Holy Spirit in visible form. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. Now, there you go. The Holy Spirit descending like a dove and lighting upon him and lo a voice from heaven saying this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased so the holy spirit in the form of a dove next slide the holy spirit in the form of tongues of fire 
invisible form. Acts chapter 2, verse 3. Then there appeared to them tongues as of fire, which parted and came to rest on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So we, have, we are using um, this Holy Spirit NATO pins. Uh, even our non Catholic Christians use that. And the dub emblems, sometimes we have that, that, they have that sticker in their, in their, in their, in their bumpers too, bumper stickers. So we, it's not, it's not at all wrong to de depict by way of picture or images, God the Father and God the Son uh, and God, uh, God the Holy Spirit. More so God the Son, he appeared, he came to us. Next slide. Jesus Christ himself came down from heaven. God the Son, invisible form. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. So you, that's the sacramental encounter, the, uh, the incarnational principle. God loves us so much, he he truly wants to uh, make us experience him through our senses, to see him, to touch him, to hear him, to receive him, even in the Eucharist. Next slide. All right. So what is really idolatry? Let's understand what really idolatry is. As I said, that has always been the accusation against uh, Catholics that we are engaging in idolatry. Paragraph 2132. The Christian veneration of images is not, so by the way, images and statues, we venerate them. We never worship them. We venerate them. That's, that's the term that we use, meaning we honor them as something sacred. Veneration, like, you know, we, we respect. E even us, when, when we are in the cemetery, we, 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 we are careful not to step on, on, on any, uh, you know, on any flat of, of, of the dead, because, you know, we respect it. So Christian veneration of images is not contrary to the first commandment which prescribes idols, idols. That's the first commandment, idolatry. Indeed, the honor rendered to an image passes to its prototype. And whoever venerates an image, venerates not the image, but the person portrayed in it. The honor paid to sacred images is a respectful veneration, not the adoration which is due to God alone. So keep that in mind, we don't adore or worship these images. We venerate it, religious veneration. Religious worship is not directed to images in themselves, considered as mere things, but under the distinctive aspects as images leading us on to God incarnate. The movement towards the image does not terminate in its as image but tends toward that whose image it is. So paragraph 2113 defines what really is idolatry. Idolatry not only refers to false pagan worship, it remains a constant temptation of faith. Idolatry consists in divinizing what is not God. Man commits idolatry whenever he honors and reveres a creature in place of God. So anything that you put in place of God, that would be idolatry. Whether this be gods or demons, for example, Satanism, power, pleasure. You can be an idol of power, of pleasure, race, ancestors, the state, money. You can be an idolater if you have so much love for money. Jesus says you cannot serve God 
and mammon. So that is the clear uh, meaning of what idolatry really is. Idolatry is worshiping anything in place of God. Now let's examine this more closely. Are there some Catholics who seem to uh, be engaged in uh, worshiping images and statues or bordering on idolatry? Like for instance, uh, the, Im or the image of Santo Nino. Uh, we would always have a procession of images of Santo Nino. First week or second around the middle of, of January every year. In the Philippines, it's very much celebrated in Cebu and And in the Philippines, uh, I, I happened to attend one of those uh, processions of uh, images. I brought my own image of uh, Santo Nino. And then uh, someone walking beside me asked me, Where did you get your Santo Nino? Oh, from here at uh, Alabama, one of the stores there. I said, oh my gosh, you know, my Santo Nino, it's, it's from Cebu. It's the original. This is more powerful than your Santo Nino. Uh-oh. Now, that, I believe, would be bordering on idolatry because now you are attributing power in the image itself. That can be both. that is superstitious, of course, if we understand that. So uh, many of us sometimes are into uh, many Catholics uh, who are superstitious mostly uh, would, would engage in this kind of thing, like you know, my uh, my I, I pray to the statue of uh, of Our Lady of Lourdes. I, I am a devotee of Our Lady of Lourdes, not, not Our Lady of Fatima. Our Lady of Lourdes is, is much more powerful than our, our Lady of Fatima. There you go again. So in that case, you are really fixated on the image itself. It doesn't matter where it's our, the statue of Our Lady of Lourdes, Our Lady of Guadalupe, Our Lady of... They're all there to awaken our senses to aid us in our devotion to Mary. One is not more powerful than the other, all right? You know, in the past, during the second century, uh, they, those who were, who were not, uh, uh, when, when the Muslims started invading part of the Christian world, and many of them were influenced by the Muslims, and the Muslims are very sick about about images. So the Christians uh, who sort of like had an inkling to, towards Islam started destroying their, and, 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 you know, uh, their, their images and statues. And that was condemned by the church. We called a church condemned it as a heresy of iconoclasm. Next slide. In the Second Council of Nicaea, 787 AD, the Church condemned condemned the destruction of images and statues as a heresy. It says, if anyone rejects all ecclesiastical tradition, whether written or unwritten, let him be an anathema. And that is one of those that were specifically uh, mentioned by the Church destruction of images and statues is a form of heresy, okay? So I think it's now clear at this point that we should never worry about having images and statues in our home, about our use of, of, of crucifix, our, our scapular, and all that. Those are the principles. So now we fully understand why we use that, all right? Now let's start, uh, ha let's have a general idea of the sacraments. We will take up each sacrament uh, in the forthcoming uh, sessions that we will be having, but we will have a general idea of what the sacrament is. Next slide, what's the sacrament? 
I think we all know the definition of a sacrament. Outside signs instituted by Christ to give grace. It's a sign. Like the water that is used in baptism, the bread and the wine that nourishes in the Eucharist, the use of oil. Those are signs. It is an exterior sign of an interior, of our inner spiritual reality. There is an actual spiritual reality that takes place by the sign, as opposed to sacramentals. Those sacramentals are simply uh, symbols of the image which uh, the, 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 the object that which the image depicts. But this one, the sacrament, is the sign itself is uh, an, uh, a, a, a sure uh, manifestation of an inner spiritual reality. Because uh, and it is through the sacraments that we obtain sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace, as opposed to actual graces. When you pray, you have actual graces. In all the sacraments that we get, we have a special kind of grace that we receive. Why? Because this is the kind of grace that elevates us to the level of the divinity. Because we become partakers of the divine nature. We don't become God, make no mistake about it. No, but we are brought up to the level of divinity because the sanctifying grace is sharing in the divine life of Christ. So when we are anointed with oil and confirmation, there is an actual reality of the Holy Spirit empowerment in us. In baptism, there is an actual reality of us being born spiritually, born again, if you, if you may want to say, call it that way, born spiritually. In, our, in communion, there's a spiritual reality of us partaking of the very life of Jesus Christ, eating his flesh and drinking his blood. In holy orders, there is the, that spiritual reality of that sacred, sacred uh, power being conferred upon the uh, ministerial priests, prison, ministerial priesthood, marriage. Oh, we, you need a special grace to be really committed in your marriage. It is a lifelong commitment. So you need that special grace to be able to stick to that commitment. Reconciliation, there's that spiritual reality by, 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 the, by the side, by the absolution given by the priest that your, your, your sins are really being washed away. Those are, are spiritual reality that are manifested in exterior signs, but they are actual spiritual reality, okay? That is sanctifying grace. I hope you are able to distinguish between sacraments and sacramentals. Sacramentals are mere images to aid us in our devotion, but sacraments, they are actually signs of what is really ongoing as uh, a, a dispensing of the sanctifying grace of God, raising us up to the level of the uh, divinity become partaking, partakers of the divine nature. So they, the sacraments, understand this principle, they operate independent of anything human. Let's go to the next slide. Ex opere operato. Sacraments operate anything independent of anything human. So if the priest, for instance, is simple, and a pedophile, but he has not been divested of his uh, anointing as, as, as uh, 
a ministerial place. It doesn't mean that when he raises up the host in consecration, it does not become the body and blood of Christ. It does still, no matter how unworthy the minister may be. Okay, so it is not in any way dependent on the worthiness of the minister, not even of the recipient. It operates. Okay, oh, it always gives grace by the work that is worked. Now, this is distinguished from ex opere operantis, because some some people think you know if you are not worthy, you're not uh, that 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 uh, consecrated host does not become does not become the body and blood of, of Jesus Christ. No, no matter how unworthy you are, it's still the body and blood of Jesus Christ, but the grace the fruit of that the fruit of that uh, uh, great great uh, transubstantiation will not benefit you at all if you are blocking the entry of grace into you so the great this you call that ex opere operantes grace is not always received it is there by the work, but you are not in the correct disposition to be able to receive it. But the grace is there. So, in other words, you are um, you, there is an obstacle to the reception of the grace by your own disposition because you you in fact you don't you, you don't get sanctifying grace when you when you receive holy communion. Or with mortal sin, you even call that uh, sacrilegious. You commit even the sin of sacrilege, right? So let's read exactly how the Catechism puts it, so we can uh, uh, understand it more fully. Next slide, paragraph eleven twenty eight. Eleven twenty. This is the meaning of the church affirmation that the sacraments act operate operato, literally by the very fact of the actions being performed. So by, by the very fact that that host was consecrated, it becomes a body in God, Jesus Christ. That is by virtue of the saving work of Christ accomplished once for all. It follows that the sacrament is not wrought by the righteousness of either the celebrant, that's a priest, or the recipient but by the power of God. So by the power of God, once that host is consecrated, it becomes a body of Christ. From the moment that the sacrament is celebrated in accordance with the intention of the church, the power of Christ and his spirit acts in and through it, independently of the personal holiness of the minister. Nevertheless, the fruits of the sacraments also depend on the disposition of the one who receives them. So if you commit, if you receive Holy Communion with mortal sin, even if that is truly the body and blood of Christ, the fruit of that body and blood of Christ will not in any way be affected on you because you are blocking the flow of grace by your mortal sin. All right, I hope we have understood that now. Not, so don't worry if you think, uh, uh, someone is receiving Holy Communion when, when, as a matter of fact, everybody knows that he's a sinful person and that therefore maybe what you're receiving is no longer the body and, Christ, uh, the body and blood of Christ because it has been contaminated by sins or, or other recipients. Don't worry about that. It's not dependent on the recipient. It's not dependent on the celebrant of the sacrament okay uh, so we have completed our uh, general principles on the use of sacramentals as well as the general principle of the use of images and statues and now the general information on the sacraments we should be ready to go to the sacraments later all right that ends our presentation this evening so we will now be let's go to the uh,
to the uh, discussion questions.